Welcome to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast, conversations with today's top ministry leaders to help you lead better every day. And now, podcasting from the Wheaton College Billy Graham Center in Chicagoland, here are your hosts, Ed Stetzer and Daniel Yang. Well, we're excited today to have a conversation with uh, Greg Laurie. Uh, before we do, let me mention that today I'm going to be co-hosted with Andrew McDonald. Andrew leads the Wheaton, is the, what are you, associate director of the Wheaton College yeah. Billy Graham Center Research Institute. That's correct. Did you tell how quickly look I at, said that? Look at that. You got it in one take. I did. I did. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> impressed with that. But he, he just, you know, is the brains of so much of our operation here. And so you'll hear his voice as well. But let me tell you about Greg Laurie. Uh, Greg Laurie, Pastor Greg Laurie, is the senior pastor of Harvest Christian Fellowship. It's one of the largest churches uh, in the country, as well as the founder of Harvest Christian Crusades, uh, which I've had the privilege of just watching. You you just had a crusade at the time of this recording. We so we, we watched all that. I was cheering you on, praying for you. Uh, over almost 10 million people have attended. And Harvest America, uh, really one of the largest gospel presentations in U.S. history. Author of several books, Jesus Revolution, which we're going to talk mm-hmm. some about. How God Transformed an Unlikely Generation, How We Can Do It Again. You co-authored that with Ellen Vaughn. I think yeah. we were last together at Billy Graham's funeral. Was that not correct? Wow. Yeah, that may have been when yeah. it was. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, um, but before we from Greg, um, we're going to jump into our conversation and we're going to talk uh, in, in kind of multiple sections. And the first thing I want to talk mm-hmm. about, well, is the Jesus movement. Let me just tell you that we're recording this live at Biola University. Mm-hmm. We're all here speaking at the same event called the Ablaze Conference, yes. put on by the Holy Spirit Center. Full name is? The Center for the Ministry and the Work of the Holy Spirit Today. Today. Wow. Today. They got the whole thing. They got a long title <laughs> in that. Um, but we're, we're celebrating the Jesus yes. People Movement. So um, tell us a little of your history. Mm-hmm. And I want you to particularly do me a favor because I want you to tie it into the Episcopal Church connection that yeah. is part of your life as well that a lot of sure. people don't know. But I came to Christ in the charismatic movement of the Episcopal Church. Oh, well, yeah, okay. so tell us about your journey. Well, I, I was I was not raised in a Christian home. My mom was an alcoholic, married and divorced seven times. We were constantly traveling around the country. She went from man to man. I don't even want to call them relationships, but it was crazy. And so I had to grow up really quickly and fend for myself, take care of myself. Uh, predictably, I became, uh, you know, trouble in school. You know, I obviously was, uh, I had to become self-sufficient. So I was a bit of a... Um, a provocateur, a a mocker of, you know, troublemaker, (laughs) Uh, nothing like vandalism or anything, but more just antics, you know? And so uh, I started getting into drinking and using drugs. It was the sixties. And so I was, I knew I was going down the wrong path that, but I didn't know what the right path was. I knew nothing of the Christian faith. Uh, All I knew of Jesus was a picture of him hanging on my grandmother's wall when I lived with her for a period of time. I always believed Jesus was there. I'd seen all of his movies and admired him, (laughs) but I I knew he was a historical figure. That was literally the extent of it. So I I transferred to the school called Harbor High School in Newport Beach, California. Uh, I was going to Corona Delmar High School. And so one is more of a, a social high school, kind of more the affluent kids went there. And I transferred to Harbor with the sole purpose of becoming a full-blown, legitimate hippie right. drug user. Right. I wanted to change who I was. I wanted to become a different person. And that's exactly what happened, mm. but not in the way I expected. Wow. So I went in there. I was you know, smoking weed pretty much every day, taking LSD on the weekends. And one of the first things that happened when I arrived in that campus is one of my friends said, Greg, be careful. There's a lot of Jesus freaks on this campus. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, yeah. these people that believe in Jesus, they carry Bibles. And I said, the last thing you'll ever see me do is become a Jesus freak, wow. right? Famous last words. Well, then I saw this cute girl, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a cute girl talking to a friend of mine. And I thought, well, who is this girl? I've never seen her before. I walked over. I was waiting for a break in the conversation. I saw she had a, you know, textbooks for class and, and a binder. And then I saw this black leather book with gold pages. And I thought, oh, no, she's a Jesus freak. What a waste of a perfectly cute girl. Oh, right? wow. But but it's just like in my mind, in my 17-year-old, very small brain, a little door opened up and said, Maybe there's something to this, okay? So uh, a couple of days later, I'm walking across the campus, and these Christians are singing on the front lawn songs about God. And I'm thinking, these people are crazy. 
What is wrong with them? So I sat down close enough to sort of analyze them. I was always a, a people watcher. And and I thought, I have to figure out what these pe- why these people would do what they're doing. And I saw my that girl that I was drawn to. And then I saw a friend I used to party with. So I know they weren't all crazy because I knew this guy. And then I just tried a new thought on for mine. Well, what if there are a new thought on for once, for the first time? And my thought was, what if this is true? And I quickly dismissed it and said, it couldn't be true. There's no way. Because of the way I'd lived at, you know, what I'd seen, I saw things no little boy should ever see in the adult world I was raised in. My mom would pass out every night. Wow. You know, it was it was horrible. Anyway. So I, I tried this thought on first. I said, what if it's true? I quickly dismissed it. So a guy stands up to speak. Never seen him before. He has long hair, a beard. I found out his name was Lonnie Frisbee. He mm. looked like Jesus. And and he said, I don't remember most of what he said, but he made this statement. Jesus said, you're for me or against me. I looked around at the Christians and I thought, well, they're definitely for him. And I'm not one of them. Does that mean I'm against Jesus? I don't want to be against Jesus. And then this guy, Lonnie, said, if you want to ask Christ to come into your life, get up and walk forward right now. This is like in the front lawn of a high school campus. Some kids got up and walked forward. I thought, there's no way I could ever do it. And before I knew it, I was up there praying. That was 1970. Wow. And that was the day Christ came into my life. Wow. wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, and you, so you give us a couple, you introduce some people to us, like mm-hmm. Lonnie Frisbee, yes. and you use words like Jesus freaks. But for yeah. people who might not know what the Jesus movement is, help right. us understand what was it and how did it impact the church? See, I didn't even know what it was. All I knew was there was a group of Christians on my high school campus. Right. Okay, so thank God for this guy named Mark that followed up on me because I had no idea what I'd done. I literally left from praying that prayer to go off to the mountains and smoke weed and take LSD that weekend. Wow. And Because I, I didn't know. Yeah. And I'm sitting on a rock all by myself. I'm loading up my little pipe, and I hear that same still small voice to me that had spoken only hours before. And I felt the Lord was speaking to me, and he said, you don't need that anymore. Wow. And I said, okay, God, I don't know anything about you. I have a really hard time believing this, but if you're real— I'm going to give my life Mm -hmm. to you. I threw my pipe away. I threw my bag of weed away. And then I went back to school on Monday morning. This guy named Mark, I didn't know him from Adam's house cat. Hi, I'm Mark. I want to take you to church. I said, that's okay. I don't want to go. No, I, I want to pick you up and take you to church. I said, no, no, thank you. And he goes, where do you live? I said, no, I don't want to go. (laughs) Next thing I know, he's got me in his car. Wow. And he took me to Calvary Chapel. And I walked into the middle of a spiritual awakening. Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it was a spiritual awakening. This is the only Christianity I'd that ever just seen. Normal. Yeah. It's not like I came from a dead church and I saw this. Right. This was my first exposure wow. to Christianity. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow. And, you know, at first I was uncomfortable because there was too much love. <laughs> like, uh, like I was raised in a home where my mother never said to me, I love you. There was no hugging. So I walk in, first thing that happens, some random girl I've never seen before hugs me and says, God bless you, brother. I'm thinking, I want to leave. <laughs> and fortunately, the place was packed, so I thought there's nowhere for me to sit. I was uncomfortable. There was too much love and joy mm-hmm. in one room for me. And someone in the front row recognized me. He said, Greg, we have a seat up here. And I'm in the front row wow. of this church. And I literally had a front row seat to the Jesus movement, to the birth of contemporary Christian music, contemporary worship music. And I didn't know until later what I was experiencing, but it was just, there it was. Okay. And so the weird Episcopal connection is, yeah, tell, throw that out. Okay. So Lonnie Frisbee, uh, he was a pivotal person now, in people, the Jesus. We, so much to talk about Lonnie Frisbee, yeah. but people should Google to get more about yeah. Lonnie Frisbee. But God, We're going to tell his story and we'll talk about this yes. in a little bit in the movie we're going to be doing. But, but Lonnie was this hippie preacher and him and Chuck were like nitro and glycerin. Mm-hmm. The, the two, they were Lennon and McCartney, right? Mm-hmm. So Lennon and McCartney weren't that great on their own, but they were great together yeah. as the Beatles. And so... Chuck and Lonnie, you know, we came for Lonnie and we stayed for Chuck, Ah. you know, because if Lonnie had been in charge, who knows what it would have turned into. (laughs) But Chuck was a stabilizer, teaching us the word of God. But anyway, 
Uh, so I, I'm just observing all of this happen, and I'm sort of taking it in. And I'm sorry, Ed, I forgot your question. I went up oh, on the Episcopal little... Church. I just yeah, it's a I'm random sorry. connection. So Lonnie Rivers. went up to Riverside, yep. which is a city about 45 minutes from Costa Mesa, where Calvary Chapel is, at the request of an Episcopalian church that wanted to have their own version of a Jesus movement. Mm-hmm. So Lonnie came up, started preaching. The place was packed out. Kids were coming to Christ, just like it was happening at Calvary. Lonnie left and moved to Florida and there was like an opening. Okay, so uh, various Calvary Chapel pastors were doing this. I was about 10 years younger and all the other guys. They were in their 20s. I was like 19. I think you were 19 according to the bio. Yeah, yeah that's yep, right. Yep. So I ended up doing this little thing, this Bible study of young people in the Episcopalian church. And ultimately our church came out of that church. So the name of the church was All Saints Episcopal Church. And at first we called ourselves All Saints Christian Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And then after we got our own building, Pastor Chuck asked if we would call ourselves Calvary Chapel. So we were the the second Calvary Mm -hmm. Chapel. But not now. Now, now we're harvest. Now you're harvest. Right. So yeah. we've gone through a few name changes. Yeah. Uh, but it is, I just want, it's funny that this story, this 19 year old kid yeah. starts a Bible study or continues Bible study. Lennon Frisbee yeah. started at an Episcopal church yeah. and today is one of the best known churches in the whole world. And it's just a fascinating journey. Mm-hmm. We, we can spend all the time talking uh, about that. I, but I want you to, you're in this milieu and mm-hmm. this is, you know, a blaze is all about the Jesus people movement. Uh, yeah. The video, this conversation can be seen at Jesus people movement.com mm-hmm. all uh, over 60 interviews of key leaders from the Jesus People Movement, many of your friends, right? So, and not, you know, not, I mean, Lonnie Frisbee's not with us anymore and others. Yeah. Um, so when you look at the Jesus People Movement, do, do you see any, I mean, it's a really tumultuous time, Greg, and 1968 was a really tumultuous yeah. time. Any parallels, any hope for a future yeah. movement? Well, I think, first of all, I think of the statement of Warren Wiersbe where he said, if you can explain it, God didn't do it. Yeah. So I don't think I can explain it, but I can describe it. And we need to pray God will do it again. And the next expression of a spiritual awakening probably will be different than the Jesus movement. But, uh, you know, it, it was a, a sovereign work of God that, that simply took place. And, and so we were all just kind of there for the ride. But, but I think that, um, you know, the Lord just sort of orchestrated all these events and brought these key people together at the right moment in time. And like I said, it was sort of like an explosion and it was something that uh, now I look back on, and I'm really thankful the Lord let me experience that. And it was a lot of colorful personalities. Mm-hmm. And it's messy. You know, these are not all perfect people. Uh, in this film called The Jesus Music that John Irwin directed and tells the story of these musicians who were pioneers and risk takers and groundbreakers, you know, a lot of them had things that happened in their lives or their lives fell apart, their marriages fell apart, they made bad decisions. And and as we look, well, go to the book of Acts, we see, Mm -hmm. go to the Bible. And, you know, God used flawed people from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, But it's interesting, though, when you read Hebrews 11, which reflects back on the great men and women of faith, and it talks about what they did by faith, not one mention is made of any of their sins, Mm -hmm. right? Noah got drunk after, yeah. you know, he landed on dry ground. Samson, basically, his life was destroyed through immorality. Uh, you know, Abraham lied, etc. But yet, as God reflects back on their lives, he leaves that part out. Not because it didn't happen, but because in grace and forgiveness, we see the bigger picture of redemption. And I think that's how we have to look at the Jesus movement mm-hmm. and at the characters that were in it is, uh, you know, it was the grace of God. It was a work of God. And they weren't perfect people, but they were serving a perfect God who did extraordinary things to ordinary people. So then going and looking back on the Jesus movement, when you look back at some of the causes, like why did it break Mm -hmm. out then? You've been in ministry now for 50 years. Mm -hmm. You've seen many other cultural shifts go on and so that. Why a revival at this time? What led to this outbreak? Any cultural factors to tie in? Yeah, I think there are. I mean, there, there... it seemed to us like our world was coming apart. And we had the Vietnam War with no real end in sight. Then we have Watergate. But before that, we have the assassination of President Kennedy. And then we have the assassination of Martin Luther King. And finally, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. So I think that he really captured the hearts of the younger generation, Robert Kennedy. 
And, you know, to see these men killed before our eyes and see young men coming home from Vietnam in body bags and riots in the streets and racial tension. And then, of course, Watergate. So it, it was a dark time. I think it's best summed up in a cover story that Time magazine put out. It was a black cover with reversed out red letters with a statement, is God dead? Mm -hmm. Well, three years later, there's a psychedelic cover with an image of Jesus, and it simply says, Jesus Revolution. That sums it up. Yeah. What happened? A revival happened. Yeah. An awakening happened. God stepped in. Um, you know, I don't know that, you know, as you look at the Great Awakenings, and you guys would know this better than I do, but as you look at the Great Awakenings in American history, each one has its own nuances and unique qualities about it. Like, you know, the one in New York with Jeremiah Lampfier, you know, it started with a prayer meeting. Right. And then uh, going back to an early awakening in American history, we have a, a British preacher named George Whitfield mm -hmm. preaching out in the open field, you know, and in the Jesus movement. I don't I don't know of any group of people that were praying for this in particular, but I have to mention Kay Smith, who yeah. was praying for the hippies. And yeah. Kay is the wife of Chuck Smith. And it's so funny, you guys, because. We, I went to this guy's house to use drugs every single day, and we walked by Chuck Smith's house. We didn't even know it was mm. Chuck Smith's house. And Kay later told me, we saw these kids walk by our house, and we would pray for them every day wow. that the Lord would save some of them. And I was one of those kids. So Kay was really the one who prompted Chuck to start thinking about reaching out to these hippies. So, you know, in a very unusual way it started. And then Chuck met his first real living hippie who introduced him to Lonnie Frisbee. And then the whole thing started to explode. Fascinating. And we want to dig in a little bit of that, but because there are two movies, there's one out now. Yeah. And then there's one coming up. And yeah. so share, share, tell us about both, because I think they're both fascinating to build on each other. Sure. Okay. Well, they're both done by the Irwin brothers. The Irwin brothers directed. Uh, I can only imagine, and I still believe, very, very gifted filmmakers. And they have a studio now that's a part of Lionsgate, which is a full-blown yeah. Hollywood studio. Yeah. And Lionsgate believes in what the Irwin brothers are doing. So these guys just released a documentary film that's in theaters now called The Jesus Music. And it tells the story of the birth uh, of Jesus music that turned into contemporary Christian music and then where it's at today. It's a fascinating story, but the first part of this film goes into great detail talking about how the Jesus movement started and how the music was an expression of a spiritual awakening. Okay, so now this other film, Jesus Revolution. This will be a feature film, and it's going to tell the story of this great awakening. Uh, there's a character that will play me, there's a character that will play my wife, Kathy. We're young people at this point, like 17 years old. There'll be a character that plays Pastor Chuck and a character that plays Lonnie Frisbee. And it's sort of showing how these four people came together. And so you're sort of seeing it through our eyes as young people who are experiencing it. And Chuck and Lonnie, the frictions that they had, mm -hmm. uh, the conflicts that they had, but how they were able to work together and what happened as a result. Also, the music that was happening at that time. So... You know, John is a master storyteller. If you've seen, I can only imagine. Hmm, uh, you know, he knows what he's doing. And this has been a passion of his. In fact, when I first met John, like six years ago, he had gotten a cover, he got a copy of the Time magazine, that Jesus Revolution copy. And he said he'd been asking around and wanted to meet someone that was actually a part of it. Wow. And he was introduced to me, and that's how we became friends. Fascinating. Okay, so when... Um but the music becomes a key part of yes. all of these things. Even earlier, you mentioned you were there at the birth of Christian yeah. Contemporary Music. For me, um, you know, we were at the Ablaze Conference yeah. uh, on the campus of Bible University with their Holy Spirit Center. Right. And um, but we um, we I, I was sat next to Melody Green, yeah. and you know, I mean, there is a Redeemer is yeah. like a spiritual yes. awakening for me. And No Compromise came out just as yeah. I was a new believer. Yeah. But that music shaped so many people. It did. Um, what? Why music? What was it about music? Yeah, it's interesting. I knew Keith Green quite well. And I know Melody. I haven't seen her forever. I'd like yeah. to see her again. But Keith was really a uniquely talented, gifted person. Um, I don't know the answer to this, okay. Ed. But but it, it music did play a key role. 
Uh, Lonnie was sort of like this rock star preacher right. that people came to hear, but all these bands started forming. And, you know, and I was raised on 60s rock and roll, which I think is like the golden era of music, you know. I listened to the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and The Who and, and you know, Buffalo Springfield. And then I became a Christian. And I think, well, I guess I have to give up music and I'll just listen to Kumbaya. In, you know, in an endless loop. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in church, and a band comes out called Love Song. <laughs> they were sort of like the Beatles meet the Beach Boys. <laughs> and, and they had beautiful harmonies. Well, Love Song, by the way, songs. reuniting and playing at the Ablaze Conference. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were a lot of other bands forming at the time, but other key figures musically at that time were Larry Norman. Yes. Larry Norman was sort of like the Bob Dylan of Christian music. <laughs> Very clever writer, yeah. had a recording contract with Capitol. He wasn't, there wasn't any such thing as Christian music yet. Right. He just was a Christian who was an artist who recorded, but he happened to sing about Jesus. And arguably, his record called Upon This Rock was probably the first contemporary Christian music so. record. Yeah. Then the Everlasting Living Waters Jesus Music Festival, Maranatha One, as it's often called, and then Love Song. So then the music started coming out on record. And uh, and it was just amazing because there was so much talent, Andre Crouch and the Disciples, kind of a soul uh, gospel infused sound. And, and so these band, there was a lot of diversity in the sound and, and it was uh, just reflective in many ways of the culture. Right. So you're just coming off of Harvest Crusades. And yeah. I mean, you've hosted Harvest Crusades for how many years now? 31. For 31 years. Well, so you've yeah. seen so many like these like minor, like uh, micro revivals that have mm -hmm. happened at through Harvest Crusades. But speaking of the broad, general, mm -hmm. huge cultural revivals mm -hmm. like the Jesus movement, do you see another one? And if so, how, how do we understand these things? Mm -hmm. What can we look for in terms of the future? Do you see so, something coming in the future? Yeah. Well, maybe you guys could help me with this. I'll, I'll make a distinction. And I'll use the words interchangeably, but I'll make a distinction between a revival and an awakening. Okay. Mm. So we've had four great awakenings in American history. There have been awakenings around the world. A revival can happen to you personally and to us mm -hmm. and in our church and in a community. Uh, but an awakening, that's something that changes everything. I don't know that there's anything we can do in particular to bring an awakening about, except pray, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, though given contextually to the nation Israel, I think in principle it applies. You know, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, the Lord says, and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So it's interesting that the Lord starts with his people. Like if my people will humble themselves and pray, so it seems to me that we need to pray for an awakening, but we can experience a revival pretty much any time. What is revive? It means to return to original condition, to come back to life, to wake up. A revolution, interesting word, because Time Magazine dubbed the Jesus movement the Jesus Revolution. We didn't call it the Jesus Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. We called it the Jesus movement, right. and we called ourselves Jesus people. Right. Time Magazine called it a revolution. Yeah. And I think in many ways... They were right. It yeah. was a revolution. It was an awakening. So can we see it again? I hope so. I once asked Chuck Smith, do you think we'll ever see another Jesus movement? And he said, I'm not sure if we're desperate enough. Oh, wow. Mm. But I feel right now maybe we are getting desperate enough. I think we're realizing that even in the church, maybe we've never been more divided than we are right now. Yeah. And over minutia, over secondary issues. What happened to the days where the Arminians and the Calvinists were arguing? Oh, we've moved beyond that. Yeah. Now it's face masks and vaccines and political things and meeting in person and meeting outside. And things that, And we're dividing over these things. You know, you have people choosing a church based more on, on the political uh, angle of the church and the spiritual content. Mm -hmm. This is like, everything's a little bit upside down. And how is a divided church going to reach our culture? You know, Jesus said by this, shall all men know you are my disciples, that you have loved one for another. One of the things that drew a 17-year-old Greg Laurie to the gospel was seeing these Christians and their love they had for each other. I think it's time to set secondary issues aside and pull together for what we have in common. And we have so much in common and, and really pray uh, for a spiritual awakening. Because I think at this point we realize politics aren't going to solve anything. Mm -hmm. There's a place for politics. Sure, sure. We need to register. We need to vote. We need to, be, need to be informed. We need to vote biblically. That's a given. But having said that, I think we 
need to use our secret weapons that we have in the church, and we need to do what we do best. There's things we do that no one else can do. No one can do worship like Christians. Mm. Uh, No one can do preaching and Bible exposition like people that are called by God. And and a lot of times we're not doing those things we do best. And instead, we're doing things oh we don't do that great of a job of, you know. And so when I get into the pulpit, I am not a political pundit. Well, I'm very opinionated politically, and we can have discussion about a lot of things. But when I get in the pulpit, I'm there to declare the oracles of God. I want to reach liberals and conservatives. I want to reach young people and old people, and I don't want to lose them because they perceive me to be uh, of a political, politi- uh, a particular political persuasion. So I, I intentionally try to find a middle lane. And the problem with that, of course, is sometimes you're like the guy in the Civil War who couldn't decide if he wanted to fight for the North or the South. So he put the coat of the North on and the trousers of the South, and he got shot at from both sides. <laughs> sometimes I feel like that guy because... You know, maybe people who are very politically active don't think I'm active enough. Yeah. And then when I make a stand on an issue, I'll get attacked by people who don't like my position. So I focus on bringing the Word of God. And in my case, I'm an evangelist. Yeah. And an evangelist needs to build bridges. You know, uh, it's a big part of what we do is is building a bridge to a person that we can walk over with the message of the gospel. Okay, so... One of the things that we want to talk about is evangelism, mm-hmm. because um, you're, you're, I want to say that you're still doing Harvest Crusades. I use the word yes. still on purpose, uh, because for a lot of people, evangelism for them, if you're a Wesleyan or a Assemblies of God mm-hmm. or a Baptist, mm-hmm. in the 50s, 60s, maybe into the 80s, you mm-hmm. were doing spring and fall revivals. Mm-hmm. Yes. You were engaged in crusades. But most churches don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. But that's, to many of them, how they knew to do evangelism. Yeah. When I talk about evangelism, people say, does crusade evangelism still work? You're one of the examples I use and say, obviously, God's using Mm it. Uh, But it's much less common. Yeah. And so, and it seems that evangelism has fallen on hard times. I I just don't, most of the time when I hear someone talking about evangelism, Mm -hmm. they're sort of like almost making a joke about it. They're like, well, Mm -hmm. I don't do evangelism like that. Well, I'm like, well, how do you? Yeah. So how do we get a passion (laughs) for evangelism back? That reminds me of a story about D.L. Moody. A lady came to Moody and said, Mr. Moody, I don't like the way you do evangelism. Moody said, well, ma'am, I'm always open to suggestions. How do you do evangelism? She said, I don't. And Moody said, well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. So I'm not saying what I'm doing is perfect, but I'm doing it. Can I just say I love what you're doing? Well, thank Sorry, you. But just decided to get that in there because I'm deeply, because I want to remind people that large event evangelism yeah. still does work. Right. But what happened? Well, I think that people, that's a great question. I'm not sure I know the answer. I think there's, you know, layers to what has happened. But I think, you know, we're in the era of the mega church still. And so when we go into a community, you'll have a lot of large churches. And I think a lot of churches, whoops, (laughs) uh, grow through church transfer growth today. Mm. And they say, oh, look at how our church is growing and all these people are coming to Christ. Well, maybe. But I think the best kind of church growth is evangelistic growth. You know, you look at the church of the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, that continued in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of prayer, uh, breaking, uh, breaking of bread and prayer, worshiping the Lord with singleness of heart. And the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. New believers are the lifeblood of the church. So what I say to my pastor friends is, look, even if you're not called to be an evangelist, you're called to do the work of evangelism. Yeah. Paul said that to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And I believe any preacher, I think any Christian for that matter, can invite people to Christ and see them come to the Lord. I think we overcomplicate it, and I think it's very simple. And I think we need to start with just understanding the power of the Word of God. You know, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Paul says. It's a unique word he uses for power, as you guys know, being great scholars, such as you are. <laughs> it's the Greek word dunamis, you yeah. know, explosive, dynamic. Sure. And so there, there's an explosive power in the gospel. But I think it's really key that you you keep the gospel the gospel. You know, I wrote a book about Billy Graham. It's called Billy Graham, The Man I Knew. Yeah. And I it was the, great. Per, oh, did you read yeah, it? Yeah, I did. Oh, thank you. I had the privilege of spending a lot of time with Billy and asking him a lot of questions. And what I saw with Billy was his passion for people, but his simplicity. 
And I think we overly complicate it. And I literally, when I go into the pulpit to preach an evangelistic message, I spend more time in that than I spend on any other message because I whittle it down to pure simplicity yeah. where, where there's no obstacles. I, I don't assume my listener understands a single word I use. Like if I say faith in Christ, I'm going to define that. If I say come to Jesus, I'm going to tell, that what, tell them what that means. When I say the Bible, whatever, faith, anything, I'm going to define my terms. Because I think, you know, our audience today is not the people gathered on the day of Pentecost. It's Mars Hill. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of non-believers worshiping all kinds Act of 17, gods. Yeah. yeah, Act 17. So we've got to go and build bridges and speak in the language that they understand. So we just had a one-night crusade at Angel Stadium, and we packed the place with 40,000 people. Mm. We had 4,000 people come forward to make a public profession of faith to follow Christ on the field. Another 200,000 watched it live around the world, online, and another 2,000 came to faith. So for those that say this doesn't work anymore, telling you it works, A, and B, uh, the majority of those people were younger. Yeah. Mm. So it still connects. But, of course, I'm going to talk about things that people are facing right, today. Right. I'm going to be current. But then at the same time, I recognize my my power that I have is, is in that gospel story. I mentioned two secret weapons the church has. It's not protest and boycott. It's not register and vote. It's pray and preach. Mm. I think we need to pray for our nation, pray for an awakening, and without apology, preach the gospel. Mm. You mentioned Billy Graham yeah. there, and I mean, Billy Graham is probably one of the greatest evangelists the church has ever seen. I would say the greatest, yeah. Yeah, of course, apart and, from the apostles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's hard to beat. Um, so you have Billy Graham, and Billy Graham had such a, de- despite being such a great a global mm-hmm. evangelist, had such a heart for the local church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the question then is, how can a local church take what you're doing, this event-based mm-hmm. evangelism, these large events, how can a local church either participate mm-hmm. in or lead out on like large-scale evangelistic projects? Where are you from originally? I'm from Toronto. Canada. I knew it. You, you know how I knew? Do you know how I knew? The way he's at out. Out. Oh, yeah, there no, you go. He's a Canadian. Yeah, I've been he betrayed. Is. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, right. true. Well, as <laughs> I had to ask that question, I think that um, any message can have an evangelistic ending. Mm-hmm. So the way I do it is no matter what I'm talking about, I don't care what the topic is, I'll shift gears toward the end. And then I'll say, there might be somebody joining us here right now who's never been to church, or you've never heard these things before. And let me just talk to you about what it means okay. to have a relationship. I want to interrupt you, Gloria. You are the, ma- I mean, I, I listened to you to learn how to do that, make that beeline to the cross yeah. as Spurgeon talks about. Yes. You're the master at the evangelistic closer. But keep going, keep well, telling people. Well, thanks. Well, I did, here's the way I think of it. Okay, I'm speaking to a group of people, but when I close it evangelistically, I make it personal, almost like I'm just sharing my faith with some random person I'm talking to. So I really make it simple. I make it almost conversational, and maybe you've never heard these things before, and you're wondering how you can come into a relationship with God. Here's what you need to do, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And look, there's a million ways you can call people to Christ. You can have them stand up and pray a prayer. You can have them sit in their seat and pray a prayer and send them to a room to get follow-up afterwards. You can have them get up and walk down an aisle. You know, it doesn't really matter. The main thing is just Let there be a moment in a service where a person, if they want to, can ask Christ to come into their life. And I think any pastor can do this. And I think every pastor should do this. And I think even us as Christians, just out and about in life, need to understand that the harvest is great. The labors are few. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes and look. There's opportunities. You know, we talk about, oh, I want to do something for the Lord. I want to cross the sea and serve God. Hey, why don't you start by crossing the street? Talk to your neighbor. Talk to that person in the coffee shop next to you. Talk to the person when you're out walking your dog. I have a little acronym I came up with. I call it BLAST. I know it sounds like it means yell at people, but it doesn't. B-L-A-S-D. B means build a bridge. Start by building a bridge. Find something in common with the person. L, listen. Listen to them. Pay attention. Effective evangelism is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Uh, A, ask questions, get to know the person. S, share your testimony. One of the best tools you have in your evangelistic toolbox is your story. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a story. And in almost every occasion when Paul's preaching to secular leaders, he starts with his testimony and then T, tell them about Mm -hmm. Jesus, right? So a lot of times we'll cut to the chase, tell them about Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that in particular. 
If you're in a plane that's going down, you have three minutes, I say tell them about Jesus. But if you have the luxury of time, build that bridge, listen, ask questions, get to know the person, and then share the truth of the gospel. Okay, so you are, I mean, you're like a globally known evangelist. And uh, I mean, I, I'm big, you know, encourager just to hear your work and your ministry. Um, I, I wonder what that looks like at a local church. You have a church named after the harvest, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, I was at Moody for about four years as the interim, and yeah. it's named after an evangelist. And yes. one of the big challenges we found was yeah. that almost when you have an evangelist as the pastor, yeah. or the Moody was never the pastor of Moody Church, oddly enough, but right. but there's a sense that the church or the pastor is the evangelist. Yes. And how do you help the people, regular, everyday Excellent people, question. be yeah. the evangelists? Well, the pastor... Well, I would say the be, to be evangelistic. Let me sure. I think the pastor should be an evangelist mm-hmm. and should give the invitations. But what is the work uh, of people called a ministry? In Ephesians 4, he raises up apostles, pastor, teachers, to do what? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry that the church may grow. So my job is not just to teach, it's to equip people. And I think it's you need to talk about how important it is for you to share your faith and weave that into your message. You know, the other day I talked to someone, you got to do it to talk about it. You can't make stuff up, right? But, uh, you know, as they see you doing it, how it's a part of your life and how you're passionate about it, they'll get passionate about it. You know, the best way to start, if you want to impact people in the pews, you're going to start it in the pulpit. So you have to model for them uh, what it means to do this. And I think, you know, you create an evangelistic culture. It won't happen by default. Mm-hmm. In fact, it will default the other That's right. way. That's right. So you have to remind people of it. I think as people see people come to Christ in services, that really inspires them too. And it will encourage them to want to bring their non-believing friends maybe yep. the next week or whatever, knowing that the pastor will always give an opportunity for people to come to Christ. So I think it's something you have to be very intentional about, have a follow-up ministry, have people trained to follow up. And uh, ju- just it's something you have to kind of put at the forefront of your ministry. It won't happen naturally. You know, you're talking about pastors and church leaders. You yeah. know, I often tell pastors you can't, uh, you can't, you can't lead what you won't live. And yes. you've talked about people being per- pastors being evangelistic. Yeah, I think um, and that's a huge challenge. I mean, I, yeah. pastors, I just want, I want to teach the Bible. I want you to teach the Bible, but I yeah. want you to lead people to Jesus. Yeah. So, but come with me to the congregation, to the everyday yeah. person who's maybe listening and saying, well, yeah. how do I, you know, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a church leader. How yeah. do I do that? Well, just start by being a Christian. Yeah. You know, I think the problem with being a pastor or being in ministry, you think it's my job. This yeah. is my job. I did my job. No, this is a day off. Well, you never take a day off from walking with Christ and from serving him. You know, Paul says to Timothy, be instant in season and out of season. Or as another translation puts it, be on duty at all times. And here's the thing, Ed, is it energizes you. This is what we miss about evangelism. It's energizing. And when you have a new believer in your life, it actually can revive you personally as you rediscover what they're discovering for the first time. New believers need older believers in their lives to stabilize them. Older believers need younger believers in their lives to energize them. It's sort of like going to Disneyland with a bunch of adults. Everyone's going to complain. The prices are too high. The lines are too long. Uh, Go with the kid and it'll be a different experience, right? So in the same way, when you have a new believer, a kid, if you will, in your life, it, it can actually help you to rediscover things that maybe you've taken for granted. And so I think we who are called to ministry and what a privilege it is, need to realize that first and foremost, we, we're called to walk with Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. You know, the Paul says the farmer that labors must first be a partaker of the fruits. You can't give out what you don't have. So let it start with your own relationship. The most powerful ministry will always come as a result of your walk with God. Yeah. And if that's not happening, then Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. And, you know, when you hear of Christian leaders falling, and sadly, we've heard too many of these stories yeah. of late, you know there was a breakdown there yeah. going way back who yeah. knows when, yeah. where it became more of a profession. And, you know, and, and Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, Hey, you know, loose paraphrase, I know you guys work hard and know you're discerning, but you've left your first love. Yeah. Remember from where you have fallen, interesting fallen. 
To leave your first love is a form of falling. Remember from where you have fallen and do the first works quickly. Or I'll move your candlestick out of its place. And in the book of Revelation, a candlestick is a symbol of the church. And it almost seems to be saying to me, your church will lose its effectiveness. We all know of cavernous church buildings yep. that were once filled with people experiencing revival. Now they're empty. Yeah. Well, you don't want that to happen in your church, and you don't want that to happen to you as an individual. So, mm. so one of the major issues that we've been fighting against in getting people to evangelize is, as you've talked on, uh, apathy, like this idea of getting them out and taking hold of it. But now, I mean, Barna came out with a stat uh, mm-hmm. a little bit ago that said like 48% of young people believed that evangelism was unethical. Yeah. And so now you're having yeah. not only just like, oh, we don't want to do it, but there's like actually yeah. opposition to it. How have you kind from of... Christians. Uh, from, Christians. from These are yeah. Christian yeah. young yeah, people. I think it's millennials. I think yeah. it was millennials. I think it was, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it's almost, it's not that I don't want to do it, but it's even wrong to yeah. do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To, to kind of co op someone's faith with your own. So how do you, because I mean, again, I, let me throw another stat in there too. When I was at Lifeway Research, we found that about half of regular churchgoers basically answer, believed in a, gave it an answer that was either universalistic or pluralistic. Sure. So, you know, there's no reality to hell. Wow. You know, I think hell is real. Yeah. Uh, there's an urgency that seems to be gone. There's a, I'm not sure if it's ethical. How do we, and, and again, I know we, we can tell pastors and church leaders, but how do we persuade regular Christians? I mean, help us persuade regular Christians to care about this. Well, you know, the the gospel, it's sort of like we're in a relay race and we're handing this baton on to each generation. Mm -hmm. So an earlier generation with Billy Graham, you know, carried that gospel baton. Now we have it and we're handing it on. We need to do a better job, clearly. And, and, you know, I think it's a lack of Bible exposition in a lot of churches today. I think we need to be able to, you know, offer our theology without apology, like teach them the Word of God, get them to have a biblical worldview. And if they have a biblical worldview, they're not going to believe in universalism and they're not going to have these attitudes. And I think sometimes in our attempts to cross over, we haven't brought the cross over. We've worked so hard at being cool and culturally relevant that maybe we've lost sight of the main message Mm -hmm. that we are to give. And so that's something that I, I think probably some of that responsibility is lies on the shoulders of, of pastors and preachers yeah. and teachers. It's like, you know, teach the word of God. Yeah. What did Paul say to Timothy? Preach the word. Yeah. Be instant in season and out of season. For the time will come when people will heap to themselves, King James, you know, teachers having itching ears. Another translation says, an itch for novelty. It's like, we're living in that time right yeah. now. Yeah. But the answer, give them the word of God. Okay, so that's the pastor answer. And yeah, yeah Chuck Olson, who you yeah. knew, um, talked about that there's a cocktail party pressure, he called yeah. it. In other words, respectable people don't talk yeah. about Jesus. How do we get respectable people who are... Businessmen and businesswomen who are, you know, working on the line, driving a truck or working in an office. How do we get respectable people to overcome that fear, that fresh pressure against it and share the love of Jesus? I would say to this person, they need to be walking closely with the Lord. As John said, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you that your joy may be full. When you're walking with the Lord, the natural overflow will be a desire to share your faith. And if you don't have a desire to share your faith, I think there's a problem. So I think it's a constant refreshing, Mm -hmm. reviving, if you will, returning again to the Lord, and then just getting out and effectively disciplining yourself. I start evangelistic conversations even when I don't want to. And once I start, And I start to talk to someone and I see God is opening their heart. This is very exciting for me. Mm -hmm. I don't tell them I'm a preacher because that'll wreck everything. That closes it down. I just talk to them as a Christian. And, and, you know, and I find this is reviving to me. This is refreshing to me. And, you know, the Bible says, if you refresh others, you yourselves will be refreshed. And I think sometimes we're always on the quest for the latest book to read, the new conference to go to, the new podcast to listen to. Thank God for all these resources. But there comes a point where, yeah, you're pretty well fed. How about doing something with it? Get out there and use what you have. It's very important to put into practice these things. Otherwise, we can find ourselves stagnating. I think we have a choice. We can evangelize or we can fossilize. We need to do this. 
let's just forget about the need of non-believers. We need to do this for ourselves so we can be revived and refreshed and realize God gave us these things for a reason. Now, let's talk about those people. If we really believe the Bible and we really believe there's an afterlife and there's a heaven and a hell, and if people don't receive Christ into their life, they'll go to hell. Wow, that should be a game changer for us. So believe what your Bible says, walk closely with the Lord, and I think your evangelism will come more naturally. Yeah, and I will tell you, I've never gotten over the fact that Jesus saved me. I share that passion. I want to see yes. men and women respond by grace and through faith Amen. to the goodness of the gospel. Thanks, Greg Laurie. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com. If you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review on iTunes. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. You can find this podcast as well as other great faith-based podcasts on the Faith Play app, available for both Apple and Android. You've been listening to the Stetzer Church Leaders Podcast. For more great interviews, as well as articles, videos, and free resources, visit our website at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.